spot reduction, losing fat in a specific area of the body might be possible after all. For years and years and years, expert after expert, influencer after influencer, study after study has demonstrated to us that losing fat in a specific area, specifically abdominal fat, is not possible. You're just going to lose it wherever you're genetically predisposed to lose it, and it's all equal. And truthfully, most of the literature did support that, but there were a few things that were not being looked at that should have been looked at. And now we have the literature to back that up, and the discussion is changing. It is starting to tilt a little bit. I have to give some serious credit to my friend Jeremy Ethier, who is a YouTuber that actually covered this study that we're going to talk about first. He covered that last year, and he was pretty detailed with it. But what I want to do in this video is break it down a little bit more, also look at some other studies, look at some limitations of that study, but then look about how we can really practically apply this. So big shout out to Jeremy. He's an awesome guy. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about this study that was in question. It's a 2023 study, and it was quite interesting. Before we get into the study, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. They are a sponsor on this channel. That is a link that gets you a free sample variety pack with any purchase from them. So you get 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, 60 milligrams magnesium. They've got their awesome stick packs with lots of different flavors, or they've got their ready-to-drink carbonated sparkling version, which is tremendous, especially when it's cold. It's amazing. So that link gets you a free variety pack with any purchase. These are something that I drink all the time. I drink them throughout the day. Definitely drink them when I'm parched and when I'm working out, but I also just drink it when I want to satisfy and feel like, uh, feel like I need to eat something, but I don't really want to consume calories. So definitely recommend it. That link is down below. If you're on any kind of fat loss routine, it's a great thing to add in because it curbs your appetite, at least in my opinion. So that link, top line of the description underneath this video. So this study was published in Physiological Reports. It was a 10-week study, and it was actually very, very well designed. And what they did is they took two groups of people. One group did 27 minutes of cardio. They did 27 minutes at 70% of their max heart rate, followed by four rounds of four minutes of abdominal exercises, trunk rotations, sit-ups, things like that. But they were obviously moving at a fast pace, doing it for four minutes. So then they had the other group, the control group. They simply did cardio for 45 minutes. Now you might be thinking, well, the cardio group just did cardio, but they did it for 45 minutes. The other group did cardio for 27 minutes. Well, they actually measured their pulmonary oxygen throughout this whole time. So they were like breathing, measuring all of that. And they ended up having the exact same amount of energy expenditure. That's how they actually came up with these numbers. They wanted to make sure that calories weren't an issue. They wanted to make sure that one group didn't burn more calories than the other because they really wanted to see, does one group burn more fat in the abdominal region or is it equal? So exact energy expenditure was matched, which was the most important thing that we probably could have looked at with this. The findings were unreal. The group that did the abdominal exercises in addition to the cardio ended up burning 2.5 times more trunk fat than the group that just did the cardio. But the total amount of fat that they lost was the same. So both groups lost the same total amount of fat. It's just that the group that did the abdominal exercises ended up burning specific belly fat. You can't really deny that. This study is really well designed. But we do have to look at a couple of limitations. There's always limitations that we can find. But the simple case in point is that what was required was for there to be an actual stimulus to burn fat. Because all the previous studies, that's what we have to look at. It's like, well, what did the previous studies look at? Why were they wrong? Why is this one all of a sudden showing that you can? Because the previous studies weren't really adding cardio into the mix. They were just saying, let's do specific abdominal crunches and see if people burn fat there. As Jeremy said in his video, which is very accurate, is that would mobilize fat, but that doesn't necessarily give you the impetus to burn it. So there's two elements, right? There's mobilization, lipolysis, and there's oxidation, the actual fat burning. So sure, if you do a bunch of crunches, you're gonna mobilize fat. It doesn't mean you're burning it, but you're gonna mobilize it. So when cardio was added into the equation, they actually looked at both sides of the equation. But the limitations of the study are important to note. Probably the biggest limitation that we could look at, especially me as a diet guy, is what were they eating? Well, the diet was not controlled. So some people would throw this study out the window immediately and say the diet's not controlled. However, 
What's interesting is that since the total fat loss between both groups was the same, I'm inclined to think that the diet didn't really make that much of a difference. Otherwise, you would have seen a huge discrepancy between the two, or at least it averaged out. You had some good dieters, some bad dieters in one group, some good dieters, some bad dieters in the other group, and you end up with the same amounts. But they ended up with total fat loss being about the same, so we're in a good spot there. Now, additionally, the control group was slightly leaner to start. It is easier to have a whoosh effect and burn more fat in the very beginning when you have more fat on you. So that is something that we could bring into question, but not at a two and a half times the amount, right? The only difference was the fact that they did ab work. Literal, the only difference. The ab work group lost two and a half times more fat than the non-ab work group. That is not something that would have been determined by having a little bit more, negligibly more fat to start with or not. So I'm not concerned about that. Although I'm sure it did contribute to some advantage, but not like people might think. Now, Jeremy cites some other studies, and I'm also gonna cite additional studies, but one particular study that he cites is one that I've talked about in another video before. And I have come under fire because of that video, because it, it didn't really explain everything thoroughly, but it did give me a hunch that spot reduction could be possible years ago, but it's one of those things where I just wasn't comfortable really making a super hard stance on it. The study was published in the Journal of Sports Medicine and Physical Fitness. Essentially, it found that when people were training lower body specifically, they would lean out in the lower body, or train upper body specifically, they would lean out more in the upper body, essentially showing that there was a preferential fat oxidation for whatever region the body was being trained. The hard part is, is think about your core. You're not like really, really pumping blood flow to the core. As a matter of fact, one could argue that you're pulling blood away from the core, away from a lot of stuff when you're actually using your extremities, which when you start thinking about it, like capillary density and like blood flow to an area, tissue perfusion is quite important for substrate utilization. We do know that during like certain activities, like you're pulling way more blood to your legs and upper body than going to your core. It's one of the reasons why you might get nauseous when you really exert yourself. But if we look at the mechanisms and we understand tissue perfusion, let's look at what was said in a particular study. I'm just gonna read a quote from it. Higher mass specific rates of fat oxidation during large muscle mass exercise are due to increased perfusion and favorable oxygen delivery conditions. That's basically describing what tissue perfusion is. Like when you have more blood being able to go into an area, you're getting more oxygen delivery, more nutrient delivery, more subsequent fat oxidation. And that makes a lot of sense. It's simple tissue perfusion. It's the same reason as to like why when you train a particular muscle group a lot, you actually can get more vascular, you get more capillary density, you actually expand capillary growth so that you get more blood and subsequent nutrients and glucose and fat and all that to that area. Makes sense. So if we're not training our core, then we would have less tissue perfusion there theoretically and less capillary density, less nutrient delivery and exchange and potential burning. The other one that's a little bit more speculative, potential mechanism as to why we might burn fat in a specific area that we train is that of glycogen depletion. So when you deplete glycogen during training, you're usually depleting it at that muscle level, right? So it's like if I deplete my biceps, it's not coming, I'm not gonna pull carbohydrates from my quadriceps. So in that same theory, if you deplete glycogen in my bicep, then wouldn't it make sense that that would be the first place you'd start to burn fat because you've already depleted glycogen? Like you drain through your carbohydrate stores, so then you'd start to pull fat. But if you're doing resistance training, you're not gonna really be oxidizing fat as your primary source. So you would have to go through a process called gluconeogenesis, which is where you convert the glycerol backbone of a triglyceride, and that gets converted and goes back to the liver to turn into glucose for that muscle to use. From my experience researching gluconeogenesis, I don't think that once it goes through to the liver that it would preferentially go back to where it came from. So in other words, if I took fat from the quadricep and it went to the liver and ultimately converted into glucose via gluconeogenesis, I don't think that it's required to go back to the quadricep. I think once it's converted, it could go anywhere. So that mechanistic theory is a little bit less plausible to me. However, I don't think it's been directly studied. It just seems less plausible. Maybe it's doable. And either way, we're looking at this and the increase in blood flow is gonna probably increase fat loss. 
Another thing we have to look at is regions of the body, because there's a study that was published in Trends in Endocrinology Metabolism, and it found that like, when you train upper body, there's a higher degree of fat oxidation because there's more blood flow pumping into your upper body, closer to the heart. There's also a certain level of like vigorous activity that goes into like moving the upper body in sort of an anaerobic like fashion. Now, in addition to that, there seems to be a little bit more hormone-sensitive lipase circulating that could allow the upper body to lean out more. But it's interesting because if you look at the difference between men and women, for example, women have more alpha-2 receptors in like their glutes and their hips, which would inhibit fat loss in that area. Now, the reason that I mention this is because a lot of the studies really are only looking at men, which make it difficult to really understand like maybe that's what's skewing the data. Maybe it's easier for men to lose in the abdomen, harder for women, and that skews the data. But again, it doesn't completely debunk this study. It just maybe throws one more little wrench in it. Probably one of the biggest things that we need to look at, however, is that of training status. Essentially, if you have someone that is more well-trained, they might just be better at utilizing fat. So there's another study that we can look at that helps us understand this. This study was published in the journal Sports Science and Medicine. And it divided people into their 10K time trial times and their VO2 max. So basically put more athletic people with higher VO2 max in one category and lower with lower. What they found is that people with a higher VO2 max, they ended up having a higher level of fat oxidation maximum threshold. Basically, they could burn fat at a higher intensity. But what was interesting was that it took the same amount of sort of like percentage of intensity to reach their relevant fat max. What that means is that wherever your fat max is, the, the, amount, the maximum amount of intensity that you can go before you're not burning fat anymore and you're burning carbs, it's higher for trained people. They can go further and farther and faster using fat before they switch to carbs. But the level of intensity is gonna be relatively the same to reach their actual relative max, if that makes sense. So even if my max was 60 and Bob's max was 80%, where they stopped burning fat, it would still take the same amount of intensity to reach our respective maxes. What that tells us is that someone that is trained and well-established, they're going to be able to burn more fat at the same intensity as me they're just gonna burn more fat even though we're training at the same intensity. Which tells us that just as a whole, they're probably better at fat utilization, not to mention more mitochondrial density, more machinery to actually burn fat, more capillary density, so more blood flow to an area to burn said fat, not to mention a more favorable hormonal environment, more efficient use of hormone-sensitive lipase, the body just knows what to do. With that, I don't think that someone that is severely overweight can go and do a bunch of sit-ups and see a noticeable change in their belly fat. But what I do think can happen is as you start getting down to that 10, 12, 15% body fat region, it's highly plausible that you could train yourself by adding aerobic work and cardio like involved abdominal work, like hanging leg raises, things like that. And you could very well see a noticeable difference. Is it something where it's gonna be like, you can just shred right there by optimizing and by like wrapping yourself with saran wrap? No, it's probably not. But again, the leaner that you get and the more trained that you get, the more plausible it becomes that you could actually spot reduce. Bodybuilders have talked about this, like they'll train high reps in a certain area to lean out in a certain area. It's woo woo-y, but they've talked about it for a long time and it seems to kind of work for them. So although again, I don't feel like doing a bunch of sit-ups to reduce belly fat is practical, the leaner that you get, it's probably good to get more blood flow mobilized to that area. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.